need to hear you over that music, ladies and gentlemen. Gentlemen, I now call upon our awardee, Mr. N. Chandrasekharan, to deliver his award acceptance speech and the 20th Anantaramakrishnan Memorial Lecture on India's leadership in a pivotal decade. Please welcome him to the podium with as big an applause as you can. Good evening to all of you. Let me first start by thanking Arna Saramji for those two wonderful short pieces. We had a great privilege. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Krishnamurti, Mr. Malika Srinivasan, Mr. Gurumurti, Mr. Sasha Sai and others on the dais, ladies and gentlemen, friends, and friends from the media. It is truly a tremendous, tremendous honor and privilege to be here at this moment. Since 1969, 19 business and industry leaders have been honored with this, I would say, most iconic, prestigious, one-of-a-kind award, MMA, Amalgamations Business Leadership Award, in memory of Sri Anant Ramakrishnan, founder and past president of the MMA. I would like to take this opportunity to express my very deep gratitude to MMA, the jury, and the amalgamations group, and Malika Srinivasan also in particular, for honoring me with this award. And I would like to dedicate this to all my colleagues, the entire Tata group, whose contributions, <laughs> whose contributions is what is being recognized and making it possible. I also would like to thank the very, very kind remarks by Mr. Gurumurthy, Mr. Sesha Sai, Mr. Arvind Dattar, and Ms. Mallika Srinivasan and Mr. Krishnamurti. Very, very grateful. Let me talk a little bit about the current status of the world and the opportunities for India and talk a little bit about what I have learned that may be relevant. As I stand here today, I believe we can all feel the weight of this moment of time. The recent history that we have witnessed over the last four years has been relentless with an upheaval from the pandemic, military conflicts, growing inequality, and if I may say so, the challenges of globalization in an already globalized world. These dynamics 
or playing out against a set of mega trends trends that are not going to reverse energy transition which i believe will only get accelerated as we move forward every year supply chain it will be a focus until we get resilience in place digital transition led by gen ai today and i'm pretty sure it will be something else when we meet 12 to 24 months from now and finally talent the diversity of talent and the availability of talent new working methods cultural changes that we are going to witness all of this is going to play out from a geopolitics point of view clearly the foundations are shifting the roles of the united states and china are changing and evolving india is finding its place clearly in the new order india undoubtedly is very well placed to leverage the opportunities that these mega trends present in this changing new geopolitical order be it artificial intelligence because we have one of the finest and if i may say so probably the most visible digital services delivery in public services anywhere in the world i've had the privilege of seeing markets both the advanced and the developing nowhere we have a digital infrastructure which enables public service delivery the way it is done in india there are many many examples and i will not delve into that india produces 2.2 million stem graduates which is one third of the total capacity that is produced in the world so clearly it is for ours to lose energy transition india is probably the only country of size which will build renewable capacity to support growth every other nation has to build renewable capacity to replace the existing bad energy if you will so all of you know it is easy to create capacity when there is growth and it is very difficult to justify when there is no growth supply chain including advanced manufacturing is getting redefined and india with its size demography and many other advantages clearly will be very very significantly well placed we can talk about any sector but i am not going to get into each of these opportunities i am going to talk more about what do we need to do if we need to capitalize all these unique opportunities which probably is once in a lifetime we need leaders we need leadership which can think clearly think at scale think big be bold but at the same time execute flawlessly one wrong execution 
puts you back. Probably for an entrepreneur, one wrong execution at scale, life is over. So while I would say all of the things that we need to do from an opportunity perspective and scales perspective, execution is equally important. As organizations, we must elevate our ambitions. But at the same time, develop the muscles, organization muscles that are required. I'll talk more about that. And secure the very right talent. At the same time, every business has to get the basics right. There is no way you can succeed if you compromise on the basics. While we need speed, we need agility, we need to move quickly, we need to think at scale, we also need to be patient because we cannot throw ourselves at everything. Some bits are for us or for a particular entrepreneur, for a particular business house, some bits are not. So one has to be very clear about that. I will talk a little bit about my experience in the last seven years. I'm not going to spend more time on my time at TCS. But TCS gave me enormous opportunities. Couple of lines, if I have to say, I spent 30 years in TCS. I learned every bit only on the job. I didn't go to a business school. I didn't do a course on strategy. Everything that I learned is by working with clients, by working with colleagues, by taking decisions, by making bets. I had the opportunity to work and serve for the finest companies in the world, the largest and the best in their business. I had the opportunity to live to exacting standards. I had the opportunity to work for and work with and manage most of the times people who are who are much brighter than me. And I got to live at different places. I got to travel, I almost traveled 200 days a year international for 20 years. I got to see different cultures. I respected diversity. I, re I, I started to learn to respect people from all backgrounds, different food habits, different work habits. It definitely made me a very solid professional. So I, I can never, 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 never <laughs> stop talking about it, and I can never talk enough. There is so much more to that life. Then I had the opportunity to move to Tata Sons. Before I start, I need to express my deepest gratitude for Mr. Ratan Tata. <laughs> who has been an enormous source of guidance, guiding light, support, encouragement, and who has stood behind me like a rock because I've taken very, very, very bold calls. And he has been fully, fully supportive, so I'm deeply grateful to him. When we started the journey at 2017, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we went through, then I'm going to pick out four, five key things which I want to highlight. We basically started by focusing on financial fitness. I actually 
told the marathon analogy multiple times over. So if you want to run, you have to be fit first. If you don't have the right muscles, if you don't have the right knees, there's no point in running. You'll fall flat. So according to me, business performance is PNL, fitness is balance sheet. So if you don't have a fitness sheet, fitness in balance sheet, there is no performance. So we deleveraged a lot, corrected the capital structure. We exited telecom, which was the toughest call. And I must thank Venu Venu is here, who is in my board, who was there then. The board was fully supportive when we took that call. But then we did many things in many operating companies. We focused on cash flows. We said, until we get cash flows, we don't have the right to grow. As Malika articulated, we formed the whole thing around the three S's initially and the five S's now. So we wanted to simplify every business. We wanted every business to scale. We got out of things which were marginal, whether it's a business, whether it's a market. Anything which cannot make an impact. So we did all that across businesses, and we continue to do that. It's a journey, it never stops. And the results are solid, as all of you know. It is reflected in profits, it's reflected in market cap. All of this happens. But for me, the most important thing that is very satisfying is the change in the leadership of people thinking everyone wants to lead. We've seen that in Tata Motors. Tata Motors passenger cars and nobody would believe in 2017 if you had said where we'll be today. Tata Motors also from, from somewhere in the bottom has become number one in market cap in India. We see it in Tata consumer products. Indian hotels has become a $10 billion company. So many companies, Tata Capital, Tata insurance companies, all are in the performing at their best in the top league. And very proudly, we brought back Air India. Very, very special moment for us. And we have made bold calls, and we have said no to many, which probably is not known outside. It's not that every opportunity we pick, we have also said no to many, many, many opportunities, because it doesn't fit us. But we have really taken bets for the future, of course, Air India, definitely on electronics and semiconductors. We will announce the fab very soon. It will be a very, very big investment. We will produce multiple nodes. We announced our battery projects. We are into mobile and network infrastructure business. So we will do many things apart from mobile switches. So all of these are bets we have made. But the job is not done. It's the beginning, and we need to be laser focused on execution, because these are all big bets. As a group, we've committed in these five years about $100 billion of capital investment. So the moment you don't produce the returns, all these things become negative stories. So I will not uh, undermine the importance of execution and for that talent becomes critical. So there are many aspects and learnings that I can share, but I'm going to share five of them to keep this to the time limit. 
to me the first and foremost is values first valuations next see tata group has a tremendous reputation that has been built over 150 years if you ask me one fundamental task we have beyond anything else is to keep that because that's what gives us the license everyone i i said when i took over he said what is the advantage i said in hindi i said har ek aadmi tata ko apna company samjhta hai every every person in this country thinks that tata group is my my company so that is the benefit we have but then that comes with the responsibility i think ethics frankly i have only two things or three things i go through in my mind it is not that these questions don't come up and it's not easy it's not difficult to make choices if you make it very simple well, first question i ask myself is what would jamshed ji do what would jrd would have done what is ratan tata would have done to do mother say what would my mother say the third thing is whatever we do can we be public about it so i think it comes to that i don't think that it's very complicated and if you can make, make it simple, simple and if you can answer, answer these questions, questions then, then we, we can, can do whatever, whatever. the answer is yes then we go ahead i really don't understand the craze around valuations it has become a needless distraction in my mind to all managements valuation is clearly an outcome you can't work for it you only have control over input executing a compelling strategy in a very very disciplined manner by the right team and management giving primacy to governance and sustainable growth will deliver valuations but people talk about valuations very easily i think if india has to truly scale it will need capital it will need lots of capital and to attract that capital and to execute at scale i think this is very very fundamental because if you fail no investor will hold it against you so i i kind of liked what ben stokes said yesterday i don't know how many of you caught it ben stokes said something they asked him after the loss how do you feel he said i feel great i am not exactly repeating his words he said i feel great because i don't we can't control the output we can control the input and i know all the 11 of us out there couldn't have given even 0.1% more we gave everything we got india was a better team so i think i think there is something to that so i feel that when we do business that's what we have to inculcate in in in, in teams the second one even in our group when i attended the meetings in the early days while i was continuing to focus on balance sheet leverage cash flows many conversations will shift to pnl because pnl people like the growth rate market loves it so it makes for a good commentary but if you don't have the direction right you cannot speed up so i said direction first velocity next 
So let's all first run together in the same direction. And even if we run a little bit Age Piche, eventually we can increase the velocity. So we took a lot of calls because of that. And we needed to, in fact, we exited telecom, as I said. Then we, we moved JLR to a different positioning. We are in the process now to position, to position it as a luxury car. Our pricing has gone up. Demand is there, but we have a job to do because this is an industry which constantly goes through change. It's in a, it's in a state of huge transition, the whole industry. So it's very important to get that direction. See, also, when the companies go through phases, it requires different muscles. We can't do the same thing over and over again. I'm sorry, I'm going back, I'm going back to some running example because it makes it much easier. When you're training in a flat course, when you're running a race for a marathon in a flat course, you train certain muscles. If you're going to run a race which is going to be hilly, if you have not done that training and developed a different set of muscles, you'll fall flat. So organizations also have muscles. When things are going well, certain capabilities required. When things are very bad, the muscles are different because basically the CFO takes over the company. Does not allow you to spend anything. Cut, 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 everything. So the people in business forget growth. So if you want to change, it's like a changing gear. So different phases of the company requires different muscles. And organizations need muscles and they have to constantly, see the muscles have got one simple rule, use it or lose it. Organizations have the same thing, use it or lose it. You cannot say I have become very successful, I am producing 10% growth, my profit is 15%, I am doing very well. So this is my bar and I am going to keep doing it. Oh no, two years, you will be gone. So you have to constantly train for new things. So I say that when, when people, when doctors tell somebody that you need to do exercise, start walking 45 minutes. So they start walking 45 minutes. And the problem is after three months, your body can do more. So you can't make the 45 minutes walk for life. So you've got to change something. So organizations have got muscles. And different muscles are required when you take on different things. And we've got to be constantly looking. I feel HR has a very important role to play. Because we need that partnership between HR, finance and business. And frankly, there are times somebody has more power. But it is not constantly the same person. So that's where the chairman has to play a role in balancing that power and, and form form a partnership. So we are doing this in every company. And some we are trying to do at the group level. And we are seeing that in many, many situations. The other thing, while this, while all this speed and agility aspirations required, you need patience. See, I'm a big, I, I studied in Tamil school. So, in fact, in fact, Lalita knows that once I wanted to only do Tamil, Tamil, I wanted to only do Tamil literature when I was young, because I, I really liked, I grew up in an environment where I read a lot of Tamil. So I go back to Avayar, I think, who is the greatest uh, sage or poet, whatever you want to call. I always call Avayar the first Twitter. So Twitter has 140 characters, I Avayar things have got six or seven letters actually. So 
one aware saying always comes to my mind. So I am going to read this in Tamil. Many of you may know. Odu mean oda, uru mean varumalamum, vadi irukumam kokku. So kokku will sit in that atangarai, parai. And then it will see all these fishes keep going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Its attempt never fails. It only will attempt one. It may take one hour, two hour, but it will decide when to go. When it goes, clack, it's done. So, opportunity picking should be like that. Every day, all of you meet bankers. I'm sorry, sorry, Krish, you are here, but all bankers come every day. You are shown tens of opportunities. Businesses come every day. They want to do this, they want to do that, whether it's acquisition or whatever. Any bets you make, I have felt that staying calm. Mr. Tata used to say, there are many pebbles on the beach, so you've got to be careful which pebble you pick. Same thing. So I feel patience is, is something very important in making calls. The third aspect I want to talk about is talent and winning mindset. People ask me, how do you recruit people? Who do you choose for the job? Do you look for domain skills? Do you look for track record? All these questions and all of us go through that. Whether you are a small company, big company, whether you are in manufacturing, whether you are in services, all of us go through. I actually look for two or three qualities, a winning mindset, a positive attitude, and the ability to collaboratively work. A person who will put himself or herself not about the organization. Every time we'll put the organization and the team. I think if these three qualities are there, they can be supported. Sometimes they need to go through training. Sometimes um, you need to pair them with other people. But I think if, uh, if the attitude and mindset is not there, any amount of knowledge will not get us. So I, I, I always believe that uh, these three qualities are fundamental. The fourth one I'm going to say is a bit controversial. Um, and please take this in the context and should not be misquoted, then it'll, I'll, I'll get in trouble in, with my own people. So all my companies will say, there is no AOP required, that is annual operating plan required. See, the budgeting process in all companies that I have seen, ours and outside, it is the bedrock of management for the board. It forms the basis for everything. It is our annual plan. This is the story for investors. This is the story for the NRC. This is the comp. This is everything. But I think this process actually stops people from thinking big and aspiring big and giving give people the space and freedom to look at the art of possible. So I personally don't like very elaborate number of criteria on the business plan. It's like a T20 players today. Every time they go and look at the pitch, the first question the commentator asks, what kind of a pitch is this? What is the par score? You say the par score is 180. 180, 185 is a good score. That's the problem. Because the, the players today have developed a lot of muscles. They want to hit, Jaiswal, look at him, you want to hit six every ball. So 
Technically, you can score 720 runs without a no ball. So business is like that. I feel aspiration is very important. So the boards, especially I will approve a plan, but I always have a conversation with the management. Always, all through the year. Where, what can we do? What is the art of possible? What capabilities we need? So the art of possible question is a very important question. So I feel aspiration, if you want to really promote, you need to manage the budgeting process. I actually like a quote which I read long, long ago, and I use it all the time. This is from Michelangelo. I'm reading the quote. Quote, the greater danger for most of us, the greater danger for most of us lies not in setting our aim too high and falling short. The greater danger for most of us lies not in setting our aim too high and falling short, but in setting our aim too low and achieving it all the time. So this is from Michael Anglo. So I, uh, I said, if, if he says it must be right. So, <laughs> so, so we should. The other thing I, I worry in some worry me, which I, people sometimes get subsist with competition. And the market share charts go to 20 pages. This percentage, this percentage, this percentage, this. So I feel a healthy competition is very important because if you have, if you don't have a healthy competitor, you will not improve. So we must celebrate competition. But we must know that every competitor has his or her own context. That company operates in a different context, I operate in a my own context. So I feel every company should run its race and not get distracted by somebody else's race. It is not to say that don't compete. It is not to say that don't beat the hell out of the competition. Yes, we must, right? And you must aspire to be leaders. But benefit will come if you focus on our products, our service, my customer, how can I delight my customer, what is my process, and what are the strengths I have, what I can do which is different from somebody else, as opposed to getting over-obsessed. So this is another, another aspect, otherwise people get into a lot of discussion about uh, global economy, uh, inflation, competition, so all the discussion goes in that direction. So. I think there is a um, tremendous opportunity for India. I think we are in a very, very unique point in time. Uh, India's standing is very high. The government under Modi has done a phenomenal job. There is not a place that you go to in the world. They don't talk about it. It's always talked about. And Everybody wants to be in India. There is not a single Fortune 500 company who has not been in India in the last few months, to my knowledge. I, I, I don't see all of them, but I see most of them. And to source from India, to manufacture in India, and it is happening. Even, even in manufacturing, I, I said the other day, 45% of the non-oil exports is high-end man manufacturing products, which was 20% below the before the pandemic. Electronics was 2% and over 8%. So it is happening. So whether it is in manufacturing, whether it is in ser services or financial services or in hospitality, any sector we take, I think we are in a beautiful place. But we all need to work together. We need to be bold. But at the same time, we need to execute. Um, those are the few learnings I thought I will share with you.
I do want to say one more comment. Growing up in Tamil Nadu, studying here, one used to look at amalgamations, Simpsons group, TVS in awe. Those days, your parents will be very happy if you get a job in amalgamations or TVS and a few other groups in here. So for me, to be here today to receive this award is very, very special. Once again, I want to thank all of you. I want to thank MMA, Amalgamations Group, and the jury for this honor. And uh, I, I didn't say it, I've never said it outside, but my wife, Lalita, has been of enormous strength to me. She is my biggest uh, cheerleader, and she is my biggest critic. critic. <laughs> so, so I'm glad she was also here. And again, it's such a pleasure to address all of you, and thank you for listening.